There's a thing that happens in games, uh, a lot of RPGs actually do this. Um, I first noticed it when I started playing uh, D&D 4th Edition, um, but it definitely happens in other games as well. Uh, and all versions of, of D&D, basically every role-playing game I can think of. Uh, where a game mechanic doesn't feel like it fits exactly the narrative that one might expect. Um, with, like, like, for example, uh, uh, when 4th edition first came out, there was kind of a big hullabaloo about the Warlord and their ability to heal allies without using magic. Just an inspiring word. Just a quick, not even like the main thing you're doing on your turn. Just a, a minor action... I'm going to say something encouraging to you and you're going to stand back up. Which is which is fine because hit points are not meat damage. You know, you're not actually taking an axe to the face when you take damage. You are narrowly avoiding it. Hit points are, you know, luck, fatigue, uh, plot armor, that kind of thing. So it's fine that there is non-magical healing. But what happens is what if someone goes unconscious? By the rules, inspiring word can still target them, uh, but they actually can't hear you. They can't hear you or see you because they are unconscious. Well, here we have a little a little break, a, a, an apparent break in the connection between narrative and game mechanics. Now, you could take the easy road and say, well, you know, we sacrifice a little bit of narrative consistency, a little bit of logic for the sake of good gameplay. And that's, that's, a valid, that's a valid argument. It's not the way I go about it. I have found, I have discovered throughout my career as a, uh, a role player and as a longtime dungeon master and game master that I am particularly adept at justifying game mechanics via the narrative. Uh, by abstracting things just enough, you can really justify a lot of stuff um, in order to make the game work the way that it's intended. Um, so, returning to our example of the downed ally, what is unconsciousness? Unconsciousness is a status, it is a condition in 4th edition that uh, means that you can't, uh, you can't take actions and uh, you're unaware of your surroundings. But is that unconscious in the way that we commonly use the word? Maybe not. Not necessarily. It doesn't have to be. Uh, we could, when this situation arises, say that they are on the brink of consciousness. They're they're woozy. They're like knocked down. They're out of it. They're having a, a crisis of faith to the point that they lose perception of the world around them and cannot act. They've not been knocked unconscious by trauma, by like, you know, brain damage, by a concussion. Because a, a, an inspiring word isn't going to fix that. And hit points don't represent physical damage anyways. Um, what, what it could be is simply that they have gotten so beat up, so bruised and battered and demoralized that they can't act anymore. And they lose... The, per, the, the, the awareness of the world around them. This happens in stories all the time. You know, someone's having a, a, a down moment and an ally comes and claps them on the shoulder and says, you doing okay? We've got this. Let's go. And that, that shakes them out of it and they regain their senses and they stand up and they keep going. That kind of shit happens all the time in stories. And what I found is that things like that, um, uh, 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 game mechanics that seem to stretch credulity, I have found that I have a knack for justifying them with a narrative and making it a little bit more cinematic in the process, so particularly in the case of fourth edition, which I think just particularly lends itself to those kinds of explanations. You know, what does it mean... Um, if you are, <coughs> excuse me, one moment, what does it mean if you shift one space away from an enemy? 
to, to disengage from them. Or even in fifth edition, if you take the disengage action, what does that mean? What does that look like? It doesn't make sense that like just taking an action was saying, bye, now I can move freely away from you and I'm not provoking. Well, I can justify that in the mechanics by being not, not just like a careful, slow shift away, which is, I think, probably the, the default assumed explanation for these kinds of things. But I like to flavor uh, shifting away or disengaging, getting out of melee as being like a feint. Like I move in, I, I, I straight up kick you. I kick the enemy or I throw something at them or, or something like that. And in that distraction, now I can move away safely. Those are the kinds of narrative justifications that I have found that I'm I, apparently more adept at than is normal. Because a lot of people don't do that. And a lot of people, I think, struggle with trying to do that. And that's why they see 4th edition as being particularly gamey. Because they aren't applying that kind of mentality to explaining the, the, the game, explaining what happens in the game via the mechanics. So justifying the me justifying the mechanics via the narrative is uh is why is what I'm calling this. What I'm calling this this skill, this tendency, this practice, one might one might say. Um which I do a lot as a dungeon master. Uh I also do it for myself as a character. And this is what I would encourage uh others to do is that whenever you have your character like, if you're running a game, obviously you're going to be doing this a lot. Or you ideally should be doing this a lot. But if you have your, if you're a player and you have this one character, whenever you interact with the mechanics in the way that isn't necessarily immediately obvious what the narrative is there, come up with a way to justify the mechanics via the narrative. And what this might mean is challenging your preconceptions about what the narrative was to begin with. Going back to the, the example of the downed ally, you know, is unconscious actually asleep, completely unaware, like you're, you're unconscious in, in the, the classic sense that we would use the word in real life? Or are you just down and out in a way that uh, uh, mimics, that is functionally unconscious? Another another example is like in and, and we come back to fourth edition again because um, that's mainly where this this kind of thing comes up the the dominated condition uh, there's a lot there's a few high level mind control effects where you dominate a creature either monsters dominating player characters or player characters dominating monsters uh, the dominated condition includes being dazed which means that you are granting combat advantage and you only get one action. This says to me that the creature is not fully taken over. They are resisting, which means that they don't get their full suite of actions. They're like, they're, they're holding back. They're not like, you don't have full unrestricted control as if like the monster was now obedient to you. No, you are sort of wrestling for that control. Uh, and so that's how I explain why dominated creatures are dazed. Uh, because there's there's always an assumed struggle between the person who is dominating and the subject of the domination. They uh, 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 they don't let you have the full suite of actions. They are going and and also dominated cannot use. Uh, they can only use at will abilities, so they can't use any encounter abilities or daily abilities. Um, and I think they also can't take reactions. I'm pretty sure. Uh, so, like, this, this represents, like, a, a certain restricted access that is inherent in the condition. Uh, and a similar kind of thing comes up where, like, can you heal an undead ally with, like, say, healing word? There was this, this balking at the idea that this could be possible when 4th edition first came out because coming out of 3rd edition where you had, you know, positive and negative energy, positive energy heals the living and hurts the undead, Negative energy does the opposite. Well, why should you be able to heal an undead ally? Why should you be able to mind control an undead ally? Uh, undead classically have been immune to mind control effects. A, a, a mindless zombie should not be able to be like dazed, right? Or, or dominated. 
But why do you assume that the ability that is doing those things is working the same way on the undead as it would on the living? Why not instead assume that the spell is being altered in some way to have a similar effect? Or even you could paint it as an entirely different spell. You know, um, let's say, uh, uh, I can't think of any examples right off the top of my head. Uh, I haven't, I don't usually play casters in fourth edition, so I'm, I'm not intimately familiar with, uh, the abilities that they get. Um, but like, let's say, uh, you have a, uh, let's say you're a, a scion. So you have like mind abilities and you're, you're slowing down enemies. You're, you're dazing them. You're, you're altering their perceptions. Um, well, does that work on mindless undead, the zombies and the skeletons, etc.? Well, maybe you're using entirely different powers on them than you would use in the living. They're just called the same thing. They use the same resource. Mechanically, they are the same, obviously. But you don't have to paint them as the same in the narrative. Uh, in a lot of stories, particularly like heroic fantasy stories, you would expect the... The, the protagonist to be able to bust out special, cool moves for specific situations. Well, you can't have a hundred different cool moves in a tabletop RPG that's too many to keep track of. You only have a handful to keep track of so the game remains simple and approachable. Uh, and so reflavoring them on the fly to match the situation that the mechanics say they work in is not just necessary, it's, it's, I think, ideal. I think that's the best way to do that kind of thing. Instead of having a hundred different highly specialized tools for each situation, it's way too many, have a, a suite of maybe a, maybe a dozen or so broadly applicable abilities that you can then reflavor to match whatever situation they're being used in. I think that's the best way to go about it. But it's definitely a skill. Uh, justifying the mechanics via the narrative is just definitely a skill that needs to be consciously applied and developed over time. Like it's it's something that I think a lot of people don't do naturally. Um, but I think uh, I think it's something that most people could do if they are aware that they should, and that it enhances the game to do so.